They left New York two hours ago on Friday afternoon, and they still had an hour to go home. They had just dropped off Lisa, their only child, to her college campus where she would begin her studies. Nancy looked across to her husband, Bill, who was driving their Ford Transit because they needed to transfer Lisa's items and couldn't drive her BMW 238 convertible. Sheesh, time really flies. She assumed it was her high school graduation day when she discovered she was pregnant. Bill was still in college trying to become an engineer. Both parents were supportive. They knew each other well and were aware of their children's love once the baby arrived. She stayed with her parents, and they married once Bill finished his studies. Over the last ten years, she has been a stay-at-home mom, watching her husband advance from junior engineer to owner of his own HVAC business. His hard work paid off as he secured large contracts with construction businesses. Bill's passion to career and family was unwavering. Bill expressed sadness that the house would not be the same without her. She has always been closer to you than to me. She said, you're a little princess. Yes, she is our princess and deserves the finest, Bill remarked. Have you noticed how she's been acting recently? She has been treating me horribly. She attaches to you like glue whenever she sees you. Sometimes they make fun of me, and when you're not around, she locks herself in her room and absolutely avoids me. Nancy, she's still a kid. You are aware of how difficult senior year of high school can be. She was under a lot of strain trying to get into Columbia University. Try to give her some leeway. I got the bill, but have you noticed how she stares at me when we are in the same room? Remember how she came at me with a knife two months ago while I was seated on the couch? I assumed she was going to hurt me. I saw sheer anger in her eyes. Nancy, you're imagining things. Bill snapped. Nancy remained silent, not wanting to escalate the argument further. She did not want Bill to become angry. Not now. She took out her phone and sent a text message. We'll be there in 30 minutes. A minute later, her phone beeped. Is that from Lisa? Bill inquired. No, it's Betty. How is she doing with Paul? The last time we had a barbecue, she was complaining about him working late nights, working too many hours, and putting others ahead of her. She should have understood that being married to a sheriff was not easy. She should have thought twice before marrying again. Nancy remained mute, hoping that Bill would retain his cool until they arrived home. She leaned against the window, hoping they were already present. As Bill arrived into his driveway, he noticed a sheriff's car parked in front of the garage. He parked behind it, and Paul, along with his helper, came out to greet him. What's happening? Bill asked. Paul was puzzled. Nancy hurried to stand behind the assistant, which caught Bill's attention. This is the least enjoyable aspect of my job, the sheriff explained, handing Bill a manila envelope. William Thompson, you have been served. Paul, is this some sort of joke? Bill asked, his hand trembling as he took the envelope. He turned to Nancy, but she was unable to meet his gaze. Why, Nancy? What have I done? Bill, it's best that you leave, Paul advised. Get yourself a lawyer and work on your divorce. There is also a restraining order. You are not allowed to be near Nancy or within 500 feet of her. Last Sunday, you and Betty attended our barbecue to bid Lisa farewell. Bill spoke, his voice rising. You both understood what was going on. You arrived late, wished Lisa well, and left smiling. That's what I consider hypocrisy. Bill, please try to understand. What would you like me to understand, Paul, that you are a jerk? Bill shouted, and Nancy, you betrayed me. He glared at her, angry. If you did not love me anymore, you should have told me. I would have consented to a peaceful divorce. The restraining order is already in place. It's best if you leave now, Paul said, trying to stay calm. Bill approached his van and angrily tossed the envelope under the passenger seat. He slammed the door shut and marched back to face Paul. 
I need my belongings. I hope you won't be a jerk and stop me from going into my house to get my belongings. He took out his house key and approached the front door. Your key will not work, Paul explained, pulling out another set of keys from his pocket and handing them to his assistant. You seem to have thought of everything, or was this Betty's idea? Bill is accused. She probably arranged for a locksmith while we were away. Am I correct? Paul did not respond, just nodded to his assistant who led Bill into the house and stood by while he packed two suitcases. Don't worry, Paul assured Nancy. I'll have my guys keep an eye on the place. It is unsafe for you to be here alone for an extended period of time. Bill is very upset, and he may do something rash out of rage. I will stay put. I'll ask a friend to come stay with me for the weekend, Nancy said. Yes, a friend, Paul muttered. Bill took out the suitcases and put them in the back of the van. The assistant handed Nancy the keys. Bill opened the envelope and began reading the divorce papers. It is time to go, Paul instructed. Hold on, this woman wants half of my business, half of our savings, the house, her car, and the monthly alimony. She's trying to take me to the cleaners, Bill exclaimed angrily. Bill, if you do not leave, I will have to arrest you, Paul warned, reaching for the handcuffs. There's no need, Paul. I'll sign the papers now and then disappear. Bill stated that grabbing a pen and signing was indicated. Can you witness this and give me a copy? Nancy, Paul, and his assistant were stunned. They never expected Bill to accept the terms. Nancy smiled, feeling fortunate. She got what she wanted and was finally free of her husband and daughter. Paul signed as a witness and gave Bill his copy. Bill got in his van. Who is he? How long have you been with him? Bill demanded angrily, go inside and lock the door. Paul instructed Nancy before approaching Bill's van. His assistant escorted Nancy inside. Don't do anything foolish. Think of Lisa, Paul advised Bill. I made a mistake marrying this witch. Bill yelled as he started the engine. She chose divorce because she knew I would not accept an open marriage as you do. What? Open marriage? Paul inquired, shocked. Don't act innocent, Paul. It is common knowledge, Bill retorted. What are you saying? Paul's voice. Rose, come on, Paul. We all know when you work nights. Your brother Tom is keeping your bed warm. Are you trying to turn me against my brother? You a jerk. Man, she is cheating on you. Sorry for breaking it to you. Look, Paul, as a sheriff, you know when someone is lying. Go home and ask Betty, then you will see. Bill backed up and left the property alone as instructed. Nancy poured herself a glass of wine and stood before Pagnoil's masterpiece. The train station is worth over a hundred grand. He left it here. Is it his loss? She thought with a wicked smile. She picked up the phone and dialed a number from her speed dial. Nancy yelled, frustrated, and hung up. He was supposed to come straight here from work. She muttered to herself while taking a seat and sipping her wine. Memories of their first meeting flooded her mind. It had been a year since they ran into each other at the department store. He managed the shoe section while still young and fit. She was immediately smitten. They exchanged phone numbers and the following day she invited him over during his lunch break. He came and rocked her world, leaving her feeling as if she'd had a wild night. She couldn't deny that his energy was more exciting than Bill's business. Bill, who was always exhausted from work, spent his nights assisting Lisa with homework before collapsing into bed, leaving Nancy dissatisfied, finishing her wine and pouring another glass. Nancy tried calling Jason again, but received the same unavailable message. Frustrated, she threw her phone on the couch and turned on the TV, but she couldn't concentrate and decided to take a shower. She recalled an intense week-old memory of Jason indulging her forbidden desires. 
He made it clear that her pleasures belonged solely to him, and he provided a spare key to his apartment. She would occasionally clean while he was at work, shower him with gifts, and let him drive a BMW. God, I need him now. I am so turned on. I need him to give me pleasure. Nancy muttered to herself. She tried to recall the last time she had been intimate with Bill, but she couldn't remember whether it had been three months, six months, or even longer. It did not matter, however. She had a young lover, a real man who could meet her needs. They could be together fearlessly. Now that she was free, he planned to move in with her. That evening, following her shower, Nancy returned to the living room, grabbed her phone, and cursed again. She went into the kitchen and made herself a light dinner. Damn, I can't leave the house or I drive to his place. Then something on the television drew her back into the living room. She turned up the volume and watched in horror as Paul, handcuffed, was led to a police car. Sheriff Paul Anderson shot his wife in the head before driving to his brother's workplace, where he shot five times. According to the news anchor, both the wife and brother have passed away. Nancy turned off the television and sat down, shocked. Betty, I warned you to be careful. She cried. That night she could not sleep at all. It was the first time she felt completely alone. Her husband was gone. Her lover is unreachable. Her best friend died and her daughter was distant. Her parents have died. The only one remaining was her sister who lived 300 miles away with her husband Tom. Saturday passed with no word for Jason. She experienced both anxiety and frustration. He could at least leave a message to let me know what's going on. Nancy repeated it in her mind. When she walked into Jason's apartment on Sunday morning, she decided to drive there right away. She sensed something was wrong. The walls were bare, electronics were missing, and his closet and bathroom were empty. She collapsed on the bed. He's gone. He left without saying anything. Nancy cried. How could he accomplish this? He was the one who suggested we divorce Bill and move in together. Getting married after the divorce was finalized, she left her apartment and drove to the department store hoping to find Jason at work. Instead, she met one of his co-workers who informed her that Jason had requested to leave work on Friday morning to retrieve his wallet, but had not returned. Later that day, he sent a resignation email to their boss. Nancy walked towards her car, tears streaming down her cheeks. Why would he do this to me? She sobbed. On her way home, she stopped at a gas station and was surprised to discover that both her credit and debit cards were declined. Frustrated, she paid with the last of her money. At home, she drank her sorrows away. On Monday morning, she visited the bank and spoke with the manager. She was shocked to discover that her joint account had less than $5 left. Mrs. Thompson, your husband went to the bank last Friday and closed your joint credit card, the manager explained, and that he would no longer be responsible for the mortgage on the house or your car. That is a mistake. My car had been paid off and the house mortgage should have been settled, Nancy said, perplexed. We have documentation proving a car loan and a second mortgage on the house for your daughter's university tuition, the manager responded. But why isn't there money in my account? Nancy asked. Your account was debited to pay the monthly mortgage and there have been no deposits in the last three months. Whatever money was there has been spent. How about my husband's business? Transfers from the company's account should occur monthly, Nancy inquired. Unfortunately, Mrs. Thompson, I am unable to share Mr. Thompson's account information or business matters with you. However, if you fail to make your upcoming mortgage payments, your home and car may be repossessed, but I do not have a job. I recommend that you discuss this with your lawyer. Later, she checked the safe deposit box she and her husband shared. Only her jewelry remained. She gathered it all and placed it in her handbag outside the bank. She attempted to call Bill on his cell phone, but it was out of service. Perplexed, she dialed his work number, but it kept ringing. Frustrated, she called Lisa's number. 
What do you want? Which? Lisa snapped angrily. Is this how you speak to your mother? Nancy inquired, shocked. How else should I contact you? Lisa retorted, you are the worst, went dead. Nancy sat in her car, stunned, gripping the steering wheel. Her mind raced as she tried to figure out why Jason left without saying anything, questioning where her plan had gone wrong. She contacted her lawyer and scheduled a same-day appointment for late afternoon. Her lawyer informed her that he filed for bankruptcy last Thursday before being served by you. The company is likely to dissolve, but you told me I could get millions last time. Nancy exclaimed, please, Mrs. Thompson, try to remain calm. Only two weeks ago, there were no signs of financial trouble. Everything seemed to be in your favor. The company's bank account is currently frozen. What about the car and the home mortgage? He used your home as collateral for another loan last week before being served. When you signed the ownership document for the car, you also agreed to take out a loan in your own name. This cannot be true, Nancy cried. Dear Mrs. Thompson, I have a personal question. Do you think your husband knew he was being served? No, Nancy responded, looking thoughtful. He didn't see it coming. She took a deep breath. So if I understand correctly, I will not receive any payment from my husband's company. I have no money in the bank and my car and house will be repossessed. I am afraid so. Is there any way to get him to at least pay the mortgage? His company was his sole source of income. Now that it's gone, he's broke. Once he finds work, we can order him to pay you alimony. We had some investment certificates, but I couldn't find them in the safe deposit box. We will look into when he cashed those certificates and thoroughly investigate his company. We also need to find your husband. His legal advisor is in charge of everything. Please proceed. One thing is certain, Mrs. Thompson, these extra services will incur additional costs. How will you cover the costs? Nancy had not considered the financial implications, but she smiled. I own a valuable painting. Great. Collect the funds and write us a check so we can get started. Not a problem. I will call you soon. Just one more thing, Mrs. Thompson, in the worst case scenario, prepare to leave your home. You should begin searching for a new place to live. At home, she sat in front of Peñal's masterpiece. I wanted to keep you, but because of my husband, we had to part ways, she told the painting. She then called her sister. Hello, sis. I need a favor. You know I'll do anything for you, Nancy. Bill and I are divorcing. What's this? Some sort of joke. No, says it's complicated. I'll need some place to stay temporarily. May I stay in your guest room? I will explain everything when we meet. How about Lisa? How does she take it? She is definitely daddy's girl. I'm the one who takes the blame. Is there any chance you two can figure this out? Maybe you should see a counselor. I doubt it. I'm truly sorry. There's no problem on my end. I don't think Tom would mind, and our daughter would love to have you stay with us for a while. Thank you, sis. I will keep you updated on when I will be there. Nancy ended the call. On Tuesday, Nancy went to a jeweler to have her jewelry appraised. To her surprise, she was told that all of her pieces were gold-plated copper of low quality. She cursed Bill for giving her fake presents. Then she hurried to an art gallery to meet with an appraiser. I'm curious about the value of my personal painting of the train station, Nancy inquired. The appraiser meticulously examined every aspect of the painting. The train station is considered Peñal's masterpiece. It expresses a wide range of emotions, from arrivals and departures to joy and sorrow. He positioned the painting on an easel and illuminated it with a spotlight. Then he took a magnifying glass and examined it closely. After a while, he chuckled. Is there anything wrong? Nancy inquired, puzzled. Wait, 
Let me show you something. The appraiser took out his laptop, placed it on a nearby table, and used a few keystrokes to open a website. He displayed a picture of the train station on the screen, focusing on the bottom left corner. You can see a man and a little girl standing on the platform watching a woman walk to the train with her back to them. The man appears sad and the girl is crying. I understand. So what? Nancy was a little confused. Now look at the same scene in your painting. The man handed Nancy the magnifying glass. Nancy felt dizzy after a quick glance at the bottom left corner. In yours, the man and the little girl are laughing and pointing at the woman as if they are teasing her. It's, it is not real. Nancy stuttered. Yes, I'm sorry, but it's a pretty good fake, my god. Nancy grabbed a chair and collapsed into it, completely defeated. I can pay you $200. I just want to hang it so my friends and clients can laugh. Nancy accepted the offer and left feeling devastated. Her phone rang and she realized it was her sister calling. Hello, sister, Nancy said, attempting to hide her distress. Don't call me sis, you witch. An angry voice yelled at her. What? Why? Tom received an email from a stranger which was sent to everyone we knew. It is a link to a former website. It contains videos of you and a guy you dated from a year ago until last week. How could you do this, Nancy? 2. You did it on our bed and in a cheap motel room. The voice was furious. I need to explain. There's no need. You are disgusting. Tom does not want you near us. He claims you will ruin me and our daughter. We do not want you here. Go see your lover, you slut. The call ended abruptly. My God, they found out. They have known all along. Nancy's face twisted with horror. What should I do now? She went into a panic. Everyone is familiar with the entire town. I need to get out of here. Far away. Five years later, Bill sat in the church's front row, reflecting on his morning phone call. He kept it to himself. He had just escorted Lisa down the aisle, not wanting to overshadow the special occasion. He glanced at the couple at the altar and watched as his daughter said, I do, to her college sweetheart. His thoughts returned to the day. Lisa called him in tears. He recalls sitting in his office when her distressed voice came over the phone. Please come home, Dad. She sobbed. What is wrong, honey? Why are you in tears? Bill asked, taken aback. Please come, Dad. I am waiting outside our house. She pleaded urgently. Why are we outside? What's happening? Should I call your mother? Bill's mind was racing with worry. No, do not call her. Please hurry. Lisa insisted. I am on my way, sweetheart. Bill was becoming anxious as he drove to his destination. All kinds of ideas raced through his mind. Why did his daughter not attend school? Why was she outside instead of inside the house? Why didn't she want him to tell Nancy? Was she injured? He suddenly applied the brakes, resulting in a roaring sound from the tires. He was about to run a red light. Keep call. He told himself he knew Lisa was working on a project until late in the day, before he even assisted her and gave her some suggestions. They put everything in a PowerPoint file and saved it to a USB flash drive. Lisa waited one block down the street. Bill came to a halt, and she entered the vehicle. Please do not go to the house, Dad. Okay, Lisa. Tell me what's happening. Bill turned the engine off. This morning, I forgot my USB drive while rushing to school. During lunch, I received special permission to come home and pick it up. I discovered an old Honda in our driveway. I went inside the house and noticed strange sounds coming from your room. I walked quietly up the stairs and peered into your room. The door wasn't completely closed. Lisa began crying. 
Okay, sweetheart. Inhale. Bill spoke in a soothing voice. He stroked her back. Take your time. I saw a man. They both lacked clothing. They had a close relationship. Dad, she is cheating on you. On us? Lisa sobbed. Bill sat in shock. He realized that his 17-year-old daughter understood what cheating was. Are you sure about what you saw? He turned to face her. I recorded it with my phone. She captured it on her phone. She then showed it to her father. Bill's world came to an abrupt halt when he heard Nancy groan. Dad, please get her out of the house. I do not want to see her anymore. She's not my mother. My real mother would never do things like this. I need to think about it. What are the factors to consider? Simply kick her out. It is not simple, honey. There are legal steps we must take. Dad, do you still want to be with her? Do you still want to sleep with her? I do not condone cheating, but we need to understand why she did it. If it's a one-time occurrence, has it been going on for a while or will it continue? Here he comes. Lisa pointed to the Honda as it drove away from the house and turned away from them. Let us follow him. Bill started the engine. They followed the Honda to the store. They noticed the man putting on his work jacket as he exited his car in the parking lot and headed towards the employee entrance. He works here. Bill commented that she appears to be quite young. Lisa responded, taking photos of the guy in his car. We have one thing figured out. So, sweetie, I will drop you off at school. Then I'll go back home, grab your flash drive, and deliver it to you. When I talk to your mother, she's not my mother. Lisa cut in her voice, sharp. I don't want you to face her alone. Not now. Not ever. Got it? I get it. But why? Because I don't want her to realize we're onto her. I don't want you accidentally letting the cat out of the bag in your anger. What's your plan? I want to be in on everything you're doing. I need to be kept in the loop. Promise? I'm going to install security cameras in our house and... Sure thing, princess. I promise to keep you updated. I love you, dad. Lisa hugged Bill. Love you too. Now take me to school and hurry back with the USB. My class is starting soon. Bill pulled into the driveway and entered the house. Honey, I'm home. Nancy hurried out of the bedroom looking surprised. Bill, it's you. Who else were you expecting? He locked eyes with Nancy. I wasn't expecting you back so soon. Lisa called. She forgot her flash drive. I need to take it to her. He approached Nancy and caught a whiff of closeness. How about a quickie? A quickie? I'm a bit tired from cleaning, and I'm all sweaty. You wouldn't enjoy it. Plus, you need to get Lisa her USB. You're correct. At work, Bill browsed the internet for the best surveillance gadgets and cell phone monitoring software. Later, he went to an electronic store and got everything he needed. He made a firm decision he wouldn't touch his wife from that day on. True to his word, he shared everything with Lisa. Over the next three months, he gathered a lot of information. He learned all about Nancy's lover, Jason White. Jason visited their place almost daily, either in the morning when Bill was on the second shift or during lunch on weekends when Nancy was supposed to be shopping. She'd often go to Jason's apartment if he wasn't working. Bill discovered she even had a spare key. He witnessed Jason taking her a whole innocence. He also overheard Nancy and her friend Betty sharing all their secrets, including Betty's affair with Nancy's brother-in-law. One Saturday, Bill found the spare key hidden in Nancy's handbag. He hurried to the mall and had a copy made. The next week, he went to Jason's apartment. It was in a rundown part of town with no security cameras and the main entrance left unlocked. Inside, he installed small, 
hidden cameras powered by long-life lithium button cells. He also found all the expensive items Nancy had bought for Jason. Bill devised a plan to end his relationship with Nancy while causing them both considerable harm. He commissioned a goldsmith to create replicas of all Nancy's jewelry, which turned out to be gold-plated copper. He also arranged for a fake version of Magnolia's, the train station, to be painted by a professional artist with specific instructions. Bill connected with his childhood friend Steve, who worked as a corporate lawyer. After explaining his plan, Steve scheduled a meeting a few days later. During the meeting, Bill met with Steve and his cousin Linda, an auditor who was highly skilled in her profession. He was straightforward with them. He aimed to legally dismantle his company and then manage it from afar. His ultimate goal was to have Lisa repurchase the company in a few years. Bill began meeting with Linda regularly, either at her office or for lunch. Linda, a widow whose husband had passed in a car accident, had a ten-year-old son and had not dated since her husband's passing. Over time, a friendship developed between them. One evening, Bill invited Linda to dinner and a movie which she accepted. On that same night, Lisa stayed overnight at a friend's house while Bill pretended to work late. Bill parked his car in Linda's driveway and thanked her for agreeing to come. This is the first time I've been on a date since my husband passed, she said. I get it. I hope you had a good time, Bill replied. I did. Can we go out again sometime when you're free? We work together and you're still married. Linda reminded him she kissed Bill on the cheek. Let's take things one step at a time. With that, she headed inside her house. Bill urged Nancy to switch her car, but she was somewhat hesitant because she was fond of her Lexus. However, when he suggested that driving a BMW convertible would make her look younger, she agreed enthusiastically. Since the Lexus was paid off, Bill sold it and received cash for it. Then he secured a car loan for the BMW and put everything in Nancy's name. When Nancy signed the paperwork, she believed it was solely for the ownership certificate. Unbeknownst to her, among those documents were others that would later cause problems for her. A couple of weeks later, Bill noticed that when Nancy goes to the bathroom after having closeness, Jason would leave the bedroom without clothes and go to Lisa's room. He brought it to Lisa's attention and she was extremely furious. They decided to put a camera in her room. What they discovered was alarming. Jason would open a drawer and take Lisa's underwear the same afternoon while Nancy was sitting on the couch. Lisa came behind her with a knife. Had Bill not intervened at that moment, Lisa would end Nancy. Later in the evening, Lisa told her father that she would not have been imprisoned had she and Nancy because she was still a minor. Bill wasn't surprised when he overheard Jason persuading Nancy to divorce him and take him for everything he had. But what the couple didn't realize was that Bill was already ahead of them. He knew Nancy often let Jason drive the BMW and even have closeness with her in the back seat. He also knew when Nancy consulted a divorce lawyer recommended by Paul and he was aware the lawyer would investigate his company and assets. Waiting a couple of days, he took out a second mortgage on his house to cover Lisa's full tuition fees. The next day, he filed for bankruptcy.